Welcome to chapter two of the Christology of Rudolf Steiner, an evening or an hour together to explore some of the themes that come up in chapter two. So I'll just give a quick um, introduction to what transpires in chapter two. I realized um, in preparing this that I actually had quite a lot of fun trying to work through the, the details of this, if you can call it fun, but just that, that battle of bringing ideas together. And so chapter two really is trying to create that second lens of how people can read Rudolf Steiner. So the first was scholarly, the scholarly lens. <clears throat> and last time we sort of explored his intellectual biography, we could say. Um, then this second lens is about, is about, you know, how can we read Steiner the, theologic, as a theologian? Um, what's his the, theological premise? Because he himself never claimed to be a theologian, wasn't trained as a theologian. So that would be one of the big, you know, questions of this project is why are you trying to make him into a theologian when he didn't want to be one? Um, but, you know, Moltmann was a bit like that. He didn't want to be a theologian. He just thought he was giving contributions to biblical studies and put out a huge amount of work that, you know, became quite a, a model of, of thought. So that's the two the two sort of things that I came across in writing this chapter was if someone, if we wanted to sort of name someone as a theologian, there are a couple of hallmarks, I suppose, or um, things that might might be needed. And the, the two that I've isolated in this chapter would be, you know, what was his hermeneutical key, which means mm -hmm. hermeneutics is, you know, for those who aren't versed in theological jargon, means the key with which you read through or your interpretation key. You know, what's is there a key, a central key through which you interpret the, the Bible and the text that you're reading? And the other is, did he have a conceptual model? What was his conceptual model of, for theology? Those were the two things that really sort of stuck out for me. But I thought to do that, I would need to also place him in his historical context. So I, I sort of put him in his historical context around um the things like the the fall or the or the the change into the the dual nature of the human being, focusing quite strongly on the Council of eight six nine um, in Constantinople. And for people outside of anthroposophy, mm -hmm. eight six nine is 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 a sort of a minor um, council where not everyone turned up, even, you know, the key players didn't turn up. But Steiner points out that there was this one thing that was just sort of pushed through where um, the nature of the human being was changed from threefold to twofold, where we sort of, you know, we're made of a physical body and a soul, which has some spiritual qualities. And he spent a lot of his life in his biography wrestling with this fact, because by the time, you know, the end of the 19th century comes the dualistic or the materialistic monism of science had become quite predominant in many of the sciences. And so he reckoned he spent, you know, 30 years re-establishing a premise for bringing the threefold human being or the threefold nature of the human being back into philosophy and therefore into its applications. And then I, I posited him amongst, you know, three disciplines, which I thought were relevant to his, his work as a theologian, which was science, where... I focused in thinking of his time and of our time for evolution because um, we have the evolution of species, um, which has evolved immensely in the last 40 years from the Darwinian kind of approach. But Steiner brings in this idea of, of the evolution of consciousness, which is meeting with a lot of um, thinking that reflects that um, in in science today and evolution theory is definitely growing towards seeing that possibly there are both aspects if not the third aspect that Steiner brings in of you know the evolution of species that comes out of environmental factors and choices that are made um, through stochasticity which is um, you know stuff that comes through chaos and chance um, rather than just adaptation but also the idea of the evolution of consciousness that um, Steiner talks about how you know the spiritual world works into evolution, but at a certain point, that reverses, and what Darwin was was describing is also 
a reality, but only from a certain point onwards. And how do we find a way of bridging those two? So really trying to build, um, and a, 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 I suppose, a, a conversation between what one would call the, the traditional or the, 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 the sort of scientific explanation of, of evolution and a more sort of metaphysical or uh, esoteric understanding of evolution. Uh, where where you sort of come up with people like Peter Russell, who, who who really said we need to face the hard question, you know, which is sort of my favorite questions when I give lectures about these sorts of things is to say, you know, just check for yourself. Do you think um, consciousness emerges from matter or matter emerges from consciousness? And Peter Russell would argue that, you know, consciousness has primacy over time and space. Um, and, and that's becoming, I think, quite a voice in, in evolutionary theory. So, um, to, to, and so I'll sort of put that, that sort of thing in there. And then in philosophy, we have, we have the, the, the Teilhard de Chardin who talk about the Christogenesis, which is this third phase of, of evolution from a, from a Christian theological point of view, is what is this, this evolution that takes place because Christ has entered into consciousness, um, adds an interesting dynamic. And then I place him in the, in the realm of, of philosophy and posit that um, if theology is to look at Steiner's, um, what I call his analytical mystical theology, um, we need to understand, is there a possibility of, of, of a phenomenology um, that can read spirit? And I, in rereading it, I thought I should have gone a step further. <laughs> Instead of calling it <laughs> contemplative phenomenology, I should have called it um, contemplative noumenology. Now, for those who don't know the difference between the phenomenon and the noumenon, um, we go right into the schisms of scholasticism and realism and nominalism. And, but, you know, is our names just something with which we give a taxonomy to everything around us? Or is there a real essence behind the phenomenon, which I think Emmanuel Kant then called the noumenon, the, the, the sort of the, the beingness of the thing in itself? Um, so is it possible in philosophy to consider that we can develop our ways of reading, say, the Bible, sacred texts, where we are where we are using the text as a as a as a phenomenon, but also as a way to hear what the author, so in the sense of Gadamer, the horizon between the author of the Gospel of John, the reader, and the text, but that there's another layer behind that of the, the spiritual essence that they that we're trying to communicate and then you know fortunately i think it was actually through you nicola that i that i you know heard of um sarah coakley's work on the, the the spiritual senses and that just opened up a real door for me to bring steiner's you know development of this soul and spiritual senses into conversation where the western tradition is re-emerging into the um into exploring, well, what are these spiritual senses, uh, you know, that, that that have possibly been forgotten, but she and her colleagues in that project go through the whole Western tradition and say, look, we've been talking about these development of these spiritual senses, which are not um, metaphorical, they're analog, you know, they, they are senses that develop so out of our physical senses, senses for the spirit can develop and she develops a whole methodology of how to go about that in silent prayer that really runs parallel in method i think um, not necessarily in language but in method to steiner's understanding of the development of the capacity to to perceive and and comprehend beyond just the physical texts and and archaeological historical data that we have so that I put him in the, in the context there of Immanuel Kant um, and all that sort of stuff. And then in theology, um, in the sort of the third field where I place him is really much, he, he sort of is, uh, the way I try to explain it is Steiner was very concerned that theology was heading towards um, pure or just um, confining itself to textual and historical criticism and losing its spiritual sense. And he, you know, I, I bring his his conversation in of people of his time, like David Friedrich Strauss, and Ernest Renan, Vladimir Soloviev, talking about Jesus the man or just, 
you know, talking about the Christ rather than the connection. And he brings in a whole, a whole, you know, opens up the, the chapter on the next chapter on heresy. Um, but, he, you know, he goes back to the, the problem or the, the issue that Nestorius brings in, which is, you know, that you have the Christ being, the fully divine being, and the fully human being of Jesus coming together at the baptism, rather than God being born through Mary, becoming Jesus the Christ. Um, that's a whole area of exploration. But that is very confronting for Orthodox theology to, to go to that because it's it's often well it's been held to be a a bit of a uh, anathema, which means we don't talk we can't talk about that. Um, so he, I, I then say, you know, Steiner really tried to talk about the spiritual quest for the historical Jesus, because of course there was the historical quest for Jesus started, you know, a bit earlier, but 1906 was the, really the first historical quest for Jesus, and I, I sort of sort of said, well, Steiner really also pushed the spiritual quest for the historical Jesus, reading it from a different lens, so again, trying to bridge the the thinking of the time and our thinking today, to 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 push the themes together, and then. Um, I'll just finish this off with the, the two sort of theological observations at the end is that I, you know, it's a bit of a, um, a bit of an anticlimax in, in the sense of um, theology, because the two things that I name are well known things, you know, that the hermeneutical key that Steiner comes to time and time again, is the, the Pauline text of Galatians, which is, you know, not I. But the Christ speaks within my eye. Those kind of things that he he really focuses in on this this personal experience of the Christ of Paul as the way to be able to experience the Bible. So that's his key, and he comes throughout his work back to this this key idea of Paul, not just my eye, but this this higher self of Christ also working with us in us. And then his his conceptual model is also not revolutionary, which I, I, I call the, the the deification in Christ or the theosis in Christ. It it matches the Eastern Orthodox Church's model of theosis, so where you go through um, the purgation and then the fortismos, the enlightenment, and then the theosis, which is the you know the, the enlightenment or the the becoming God of the human being but in Christ, so in and through Christ. So I've named his model of, and I, I sort of bring four, four um, aspects of how then he, out of that model, you can read the Bible, which is, you know, Jesus Christ was historical. We need that historical criticism, but also Christ is a, a an objective spiritual being that works through evolution for the, for him, for the, for our creation and especially the evolution of human consciousness but then also that the gospels are um, initiation texts not just historical texts and the fourth part of that is that every human being can use the narrative as a personal journey of exploring this not i but the christ in me and that that then kind of rounds out that second chapter of the the lens to give people who want an approach to to steiner's christology of well, there is actually a, a, a basis to to say this is quite sound theology. It's not just, you know, random disconnected um, statements that are hard. I mean, there's a lot of random disconnected statements that are hard to digest. But if we have at least a model and a, a terminal key, we can we can ground it somewhere. So that I think sums up the the second chapter. I think. Thanks for that, Jude. Uh, you, you said in your email, this chapter is huge. Uh, absolutely. And just listening to you, so I've, I've written down, I don't know, nearly a dozen questions that I'd love to ask just based on what you've so like said in your brief introduction there. It is so rich. There's, there's so much going on. Yeah. Um, I would love to so like talk more about it's like the 869 angle, uh, this analytical mystical theology, it's like the reading Bibles literature. But we're going to start with the questions that you seeded with, and they might lead us into these these questions that sort of like arise from me listening to you and having reread your um, reread your work yesterday or the last couple of days. Oh, that's more. Um, <laughs> sorry, go on. Say again. That's more fresh than me. I was preparing for last week and I didn't get back to it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, 
In, in the context of uh, so like eight eight sixty nine that you were talking about, it's like one of the first questions that comes to mind is. Um, so what is the importance of this interface between empirical science and spiritual science? Um, why why do they become sort of like super relevant in this 869 uh, uh, um, Council of Con Constantinople? Um, and how does that work? How, how does or how does that sort of like connect to the work that like Nicholas uh, organization? uh is up to and th there's another one called icecast which i don't know what that is but you might like to elaborate there as as well nicola do you want to say something on iscast you need to and un and you need to unmute yourself this cast is just the australian science and theology organization uh, okay it's something like yeah, so it's a very hard acronym to remember. Science and technology in an age of something or other. But it's long past, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just known as ISCAS now. Yeah. Yeah. It means something Christians in science and technology or something, something like that. Yes, yes, yes. So it's, 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 your, it's a sort of a sister organization because you, you yeah. sort of interface quite a lot between the two, don't you? Yeah. 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 I mean, Yeah, they're much bigger than we are, and they've been going for a long time. And um, we are a, you know, fledgling organization compared to them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, so let's, you know, my understanding, and this would be also interesting for Raynand to possibly. Yes. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Science, yeah. in the of the sciences, because as a science teacher, he may have something to offer there. Um, but my understanding was that, you know, in Steiner's uh, descriptions of um, how human consciousness evolves, there comes a time where um, the more imaginative mythological understanding and comprehension of the world becomes enclosed in the intellect and the processes of reason, um, which was a necessary and good thing for us to mm -hmm. do because we could, you know, learn how to live on the earth and, and create things you know and utilize the earth so it's not it's not a negative thing but he, he saw that as that came in it had the tendency because the more imaginative mythological knowledge was getting lost especially this is now eurocentric um you know i think that's one of the critiques of steiner is we have to read him as eurocentric in his commentary um because this is not an indigenous experience mm -hmm. Um, and, and we really need to remember that. Um, but in that Western philosophy, um, the tendency to then become purely, um, well, I suppose from a from a metaphysical point of view, to preference um, material materialistic monism that everything needs to be explained exclusively through the reading and measuring of the material world. And science took up a big turn from 869. Scholasticism opened up. And Steiner saw this, this schism happening in humanity so that there were people who were still, you know, able to keep the imaginative esoteric side going. But there was this push in scholasticism out of which then natural science was born. Um, he sort of makes that wry comment that if science knew that they came from the Catholic Church, they might turn over in their grave. But there was that, <laughs> with that dualism. that And that, that push at that time, just before... The sort of the, the birth of the of the you know the 1500s Copernicus all that sort of Descartes kind of thinking really just dropped us in into a need to preference only one side of our understanding and I think he then sort of hooks on to that by you know by the time Immanuel Kant and the whole sort of 19th century 18th 19th centuries coming he just had this real sense that there's a schism about about to happen and and really wanted to push this the spiritual scientific side and he calls it spiritual science so anthroposophy isn't spiritual science anthroposophy is the, the 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 philosophy and the understandings that come from the spiritual scientific um approach to things i mean he calls anthroposophy a spiritual anthropology and it's actually 
as an anthropology, but from a spiritual perspective. And he never, he never wanted it to be an alternative. You know, he always, uh, and you know, even today, one of the critiques of anthroposophy might be that we've forgotten this, but he never said there's anthroposophical medicine or there's anthroposophical science. He always said there's science with an expansion through spiritual science. You know, we we adding to understanding rather than replacing and making that other science um, irrelevant. And I think there's a, a misunderstanding that has crept in there, possibly from both sides. Um, so yeah, I just I just sort of see that um, he he we really had the sense we need to develop a scientific method that is again, I, I suppose that in that sense of of being able to measure somehow in a reasonable way, the effects of spirit upon things. Hmm. You, you mentioned there the importance of the difference between uh, nominalism and scholasticism. What was going going on there? Also, having recently reread re Slow Redemption, I think, would, would you like to just like unpack that for, for the listeners? Why that is sort of like so, so key. It sounds like boring 700 years ago philosophy yeah, yeah. that isn't relevant today. But it is so essential to yeah, and you could call it, a it you could call it a renaissance. You know, if you go back a step to Plato and Aristotle, Plato's and the Neoplatonists still had a sense of you know the 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 essence behind things. And you could call Aristotle the first materialistic scientist with these categories. You know, he said no, we just need to measure, and he really pushed it into. Um, into what we would call the, the first hallmarks in again European science, the the measurement aspect of of science, and I think that just repeats itself into further and further consequences. So by the time you get to the medieval times, the nine hundreds, the twelve hundreds, you really at a point where that intellectual prowess is starting to to really show itself and has a tendency to to go off on its own reality. Um, and I think that's why he he highlights that moment because that's where, you know, at that point the Catholic Church was still very predominant in 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 the Western part of Europe, and they snuck this 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 this. It was it was unread. It was it was apparently one of the. It's a, it's a little clause, clause eleven, and one of the, the we don't know I don't know who, but someone sort of pushed it in there. It was just passed through, and then it just takes off as. Um, I mean, I know I grew up Roman Catholic. That was really what we were what we were taught. You know, you are you are a body, and you you receive your soul when you are born, and it's got some spiritual attributes, and then it moves to eternity, and that has just become so deeply entrenched in in the Western psyche, I suppose. Mm, yeah. Um, and Steiner really wanted to push it. That you know, I think he. I don't know if he was the first to push it, but he was certainly one of the early proponents. That I now see emerging, and through the PhD and with Nicholas' conversations we had, where a lot of science is really picking up. I mean, Nicola can probably list these people much better than I can, who are really um, working with these things. I mean, you talked about Tom last time, Nicola. Tom. The yeah. um the oh what's that name the servant. The master and his servant. Oh, oh McGilchrist. Gilchrist. Oh, yes, 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 sorry. Ian McGilchrist. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, uh, that everything you say just sort of re resonates with that, you know, and it yeah. resonates with everything. I mean, the only thing I would say is that um, the progression from hasn't been sort of like a straight line. You know, there have been waves of rationalism followed by. Um, you know, romanticism and 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 follow and all revival sometimes, you know. And so we haven't just gone on a in a straight line becoming more and more rational. But um in the last 200 years perhaps we have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Raynan, did you have anything to say on the sort of the difference between the two sciences? You're you're a science teacher, and you're sort of mm. exploring Steiner method. Um, my commentary on anthroposophy. Um, one of the adv advocates uh, says that um, anthroposophy itself is a method. We know science is also a method, 
It's a systematic body of knowledge, but at the same time, a method. Anthroposophy, from the Steiner's point of view, is also a method to understand the meta uh, physical reality or the spiritual um, nature of man, of our existence. Mm-hmm. Um, because he believes, Steiner believes that, you know, we are not only made of matter, atom, carbon, but we have a soul or spirit and spirit. So that being said, um, in the context of teaching practice, um, integrating this anthroposophy, um, the teaching practice, the, the pedagogy should be um, holistic, should be interconnected, something like that, uh, very different from the conventional way of teaching, very different from the mainstream education. So, um, so I'm exploring at the moment how it is being done at the Steiner School. So mm-hmm. this year, 2024, um, is the year where I'm going to explore that data collection. So I'm not quite certain yet, though I have some um, understanding how it is being done based from my literature, but um, like literally seeing how they are being done. So that is something that I'm going to explore um, at the moment of speaking, about to explore. Um, So yeah, um, I think it's sensible to me because, you know, I've been teaching in the public the conventional way of doing education for 16 years. And this is completely different for me. Um, So that's what I'm going to find out as well. But the literature, the anthroposophical point of view, again, um, it's sensible to me when they say that it's a method. I think it makes sense because uh, in the first place, the science that we know then the the science that we know is also a method. So when you speak of method, science is not probably the only way to understand what is out there. Because when you speak of method, there could be a lot of methods. There yeah. could be a lot of they, there could be a lot of exits. If you want to exit this house, if you can't use the main door, you can do other doors or the back doors, etc. Even the windows, it's up to you. Um so from that point, it makes sense and it resonates as well overall to my Catholic perspective. I think the more I understand anthroposophy, the more it gives me an enlightenment about the, my Christian understanding. So mm-hmm. overall, it's just meaningful to me. I think, um, and also lastly, only when I started um, reading anthroposophy, that gives me a better perspective of why there is a necessity for Jesus to step in our space time and why mm-hmm. there why Jesus should be born and why it is necessary for Jesus to 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 be born, something like that. So I think the what happened um in the Pascal mystery, especially that thing at the Mount Golgotha really changed the landscape of human consciousness, the way mm-hmm. we think. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't really speak further, but everything seems, it's just meaningful to me. There are some things that I cannot really explain using, um, I mean, I cannot really find sometimes appropriate word, material, earthly words to address sometimes what I'm thinking because it's just completely profound sometimes. Mm-hmm. There are things that I understand, but I cannot explain it using a material world, uh, word. Yeah. It's just um, deep sometimes. So anyway, I'm done. Thank you. It's a long journey, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It'll be very interesting to hear at some point how you experience the classroom then, you know, once you've done a year of that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Martin, sorry, Jude. Um, just like to comment, so, uh, Raynan said something that I think is really important there, which is easy for people to um, less have, have a less clear distinction. He talked about science as a body of knowledge versus a method. And I think this ties in intimately to your sort of like hermeneutical lens here. Do you want to sort of like it, it, it expand that a little bit? Why is it really key that we have to 
distinguish between body of knowledge, what we know through the process of science, and the hermeneutical science through which it's like science as it's commonly understood. What is that lens and how does it differ dramatically from the lens that Steiner is, is looking through and that you're also finding in other um, modern theological debates? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, absolutely. I mean, the body of knowledge and the method are really important, important things to to look at in any point of view. I mean, we could go to indigenous knowledges, um, first knowledges, as we're calling it here in Australia, um, and they've got method and they've got knowledge or content of their philosophy that come from the method of, of dreaming, the dreaming method. And I think for me, it became quite important at a certain point to differentiate between the words spiritual science and anthroposophy. So you would have, you know, you have materialistic monism as the as the um, metaphysics behind modern science. And then you've got empiricism as its method. And then you have the, you know, the, the various schools of, of knowledge that come from that biology, you know, hundreds of different compartments or libraries of knowledge that come from that that thing and then when you come to the sort of more uh, this is the part of the problem of reading steiner is when you come to the mystical and someone like sarah coakley has also gone we don't want to call it mysticism because that connotes you know someone's you know um, musing and and, and it's, it's it's how do you how do you actually hold it down to verifiable knowledge, which is a need for science is is that. And so Steiner differentiates between um, we could say that his metaphysics is esoteric. I'm just playing with that at the moment, but he's certainly his method is what he calls spiritual science. So the spiritual science, and that's why it was important to define contemplative contemplative phenomenology as the method of spiritual science, whereas anthroposophy is the body of knowledge that emerges from that method. And again, you, you run into a, a problem in that if you're looking at the empirical science, there's huge volumes of, you know, proven knowledge. Whereas when you come to analytical mystical methods, you, you you know, and he always he always Steiner always sort of pushed against it. Don't just take this because I you know Steiner says, and it's a, it's a bit of a, a habit in anthroposophy where people say, well Steiner said, that's why we know it's true, which doesn't hold sway in the academy or in 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 science. It just doesn't hold it just doesn't hold water. It's not good enough, and so being able to represent a, a a, an esoteric or a, a mystical method to, and, you know, Sarah Coakley is doing that in her own way of getting verifiable experience and then collaborating. That. And that's where Steiner, you know, or even in, in, in mainstream theology would be called what we call experience theology or liturgical theology, where you have a God experience. And then you go to your secondary authors like Aquinas or you know Thomas Merton to say, oh he, you know I can I can language this in alliance with Steiner or Teilhard de Chardin or Richard Rohr, all these these mystics, um you know Hildegard of Bingen. Um there's a lot of mystics who have had their experience and have had the good fortune of of writing it down as a body of knowledge. And when we line them all up, there's, a, there's an increasing um volume or archive of experience that's starting to I think is quite verifiable in a sense of we can actually start to trust that um and Steiner would be the place where I think I go I go I've had my experience of Easter as, as Ray Nam was saying and I can go to Steiner and go you know what those two those two resonate I'm going to start adapting my language with this and I think that's how science works uh, you know, I've had an experience, I've experimented with it, and I'm starting to define the laws. So I will turn to such and such a person. We we will collaborate to to bring more clarity to the body of knowledge through this thing. And, and it's interesting in, in this sense, I think we, we need to turn our, our eye to open science, the open science methodology, where, where when you're doing your your sort of your proposal for your PhD, you don't you don't give your um 
you 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 only you you don't try and tell tell them what your outcome is going to be. You you just get your your method approved because you know you're trying to contribute to knowledge, and it, it might be against current things. If you if we can approve the methods, then we have to read the the outcome slightly differently. I mean that's a very simplistic version of open science, but rather than trying to you know safeguard the outcome, um, mm -hmm. yeah. You, you, you said something really interesting there, and I'd like to just like open it up to everybody. So this this idea that mysticism is not acceptable, but experience is. But then when you sort of like when you sort of like unpack it, it becomes the same thing. What is that telling us about our, our about our own um, about ourselves in our search for understanding? And, and knowledge. And I'm, I'm just going to give a counter argument to what you're saying as, as, as a way of balancing, but I, I'm really interested to hear what Nick Lorraine and, and, and Craig's like think on this, why mysticism is not acceptable and experience is. One of the reasons why I think it is so valuable to talk about mysticism, because it reconnects us with history. So like all of those great thinkers in the past that have contributed to where we are now, they become immediately accessible and sources of different different ways of describing what we now are happily calling experience and they happily called mysticism uh, back then uh, and so if, if for me it invites me to so like to 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 read the classics as well as well as the modern thinkers on it but this this rejection of um just as a mysticism is an example and there are lots of others what what do we think as like as, as a group what do we think is is going on that what does it tell us about ourselves and um and the method that we use <laughs> okay, shall I ask you another question? Well, <laughs> or did mean, you want I, to I say something agree, on that? I would agree with you, Angus, that I mean, mysticism is a part of the whole, you know, experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of, one of the interesting things that I've learned through participating with Nicola in the in New Zealand's Christians in Science dialogue, which is Christians in Science, Christians in Science, mm -hmm. dialoguing about their religion and their experiences is that I, I just found this a great relief when I, I sort of joined that those conferences is is that there's there's this um it's the assumed impasse between science and religion of pop science rather than what's happening between the theologians and the scientists who really don't have that Oh, these two can't be, you know, the Descartes, you know, the, the schism that Descartes brought in. Actually, when, when we talk professionally, it's a bit frustrating to be told they can't communicate because we do. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and it's mystical. I mean, even in science, the, the scientists, when they're talking about their, their journey, are describing a, a journey of pondering the imponderables rather than measuring them. Yeah. And, and there's a really significant uh, moment in it's like the developments of like and modern so like quantum physics, which is if yeah. you look at the Heisenbergs and the Schrodingers and all of these people, I, I can't give an exact percentage, but the vast majority, they were profoundly interested in it's like in mystical writings. If I've understood it correctly, it's predominantly from Eastern literature, which is a sad reflection on where we were. It's like in in the West. Uh, it's like in Western Europe at the time when this was happening, um, but but it, it speaks to what you're uh, saying now, I believe, Martin. That like, true so Coakley... scientists are interested. Yeah, and Sarah Coakley says we, you know, she shies away from using the word mysticism because of its um, pop connotation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is if you understand it as a, a true method, so yeah. she sort of just yeah. tries to separate it out purely from a semantic point of view rather than a, a deeper yeah so like use this word with caution <laughs> approach yeah yeah because it, it yeah. sparks people craig a couple of things is one um 
they're, they're both sort of quotes from your chapter two and, and one is around the emphasis that Steiner places on the individual spiritual development I wonder what role that plays in these conversations that we're talking about having today um, given that we're all free to do as little or as much on our spiritual development as we see fit um, and the other quote you talk about in there just grab it on the page it, it talks about contemplating a question allows a conversation to emerge and again I, I wonder today how far we've gotten away from in, in certain aspects from those conversations you know we, we, we're very much focused on the answer as opposed to allowing the conversation to unfold without the yeah and I, I guess that's part of your contemplative phenomenology is to be able to kind of bracket what we already know and you know allow a conversation to to happen to see what emerges so that, mm -hmm. that'd be the two points around just that that constant tension that seems to still exist between aspects of science and aspects of mysticism yeah yeah well i suppose we would have to look at the application of that i mean from my point of view of where that fits in in theology and where it fits in in science they may not be different um i just remember when um i was writing at my cello he won the the templeton prize for science um a few years back and one of his observations was you know in, i didn't read his work very deeply but i did read his sort of the <laughs> the, the newspaper articles about him winning the prize but his interview with him was very much around that that sort of thing of, you know, as a scientist, we we reach this point where where we can't find the answer from measurement alone, and that's where the scientist has to enter into this reverent pondering of the subject, um, and that's religious. That's a religious gesture to be able to do that. But I think for Steiner. Um, and, you know, I resonate with this because I grew up Roman Catholic and, you know, I grew up, grew up through the Second Vatican Council, whereas Steiner was still at a time where, you know, the mass was in Latin um, and people couldn't understand it. And it was very much a, a deferring or a, I mean, through the liturgy, people could, through the magic of the, of the Latin language, they could have a deep God experience. But you know, going right back to Martin Luther with, with, the, with the phenomenology of give the people the text to read for themselves. I think there was a real push. Again, coming out of the scholasticism, so in the 14th, 15th century, there was this real push to go back to what we could call a more Gnostic um, approach to, to Christianity, which is it's, it's through the personal experience. Now, that you probably, if we analyze that a bit, you probably find that's always been the case. But it was a little bit um, taken into, into the institutionalization version of that, where the answers to your experience were given to you out of the doctrines and the dogmas, um, whereas this conversational element were, was possibly... I certainly remember being in the, in the, in the Catholic seminary where uh, and part of the reason why I left that was because every time you asked a question, you, you sort of... Not every time, but often, often you, I came up against this answer of, we can't know that. We have to just allow tradition to teach us or wait in faith to be given the answer. And I got a bit frustrated with that. And, and, you know, eventually that's where Steiner hit the mark for me because he allowed these things of saying, well, take take this idea and chew on it. <laughs> um, we know some of the themes. Nicola and I had a, a couple of themes going there that, you know, wow, how are we going to, you know, talk about that? Um, but, you know, if you just take the idea and have this inner conversation, which is the mystical pondering, plus a more robust um, theological conversation, these things can can come out of out of personal experience, can come to personal experience. And I think for Stana, that's really where spirituality has to. And I think religion is heading in this direction more and more of of. We, we honor the personal experience in conversation to bring about higher, you know, higher understanding and cohesion of thought. I mean, I might be wrong on that, Nick. I don't know how you, you feel about that in a, as a broadside statement about church history. <laughs> uh, 
Were you going to comment there, Nukla, or shall I? I had a, a, a hey, further question go for. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. Um, you, you, when you were giving like the brief in, uh, overview in the beginning there, uh, Jude, you said you would probably rename uh, the, the term that you used in the PhD was contemplative phenomenology, uh, but you think uh, contemplative pneumonology would be like more appropriate. Do you want to? Just want to unpack that. It's like in the context of the conversation we've just been having. Having. Yeah. Look, I mean, the the the, the limitation of the word phenomenology regarding an experience of the spirit is a philosophical question. I push the barrow there, I suppose, and say, can the idea in itself be something that we can behold as a phenomenon, a spiritual phenomenon, which it philosophically is probably called the noumenon mm. and therefore i i didn't sort of push it to that level i've only sort of retrospectively thought well maybe that would differentiate it a bit more clearly so but then you come back to the other part of the problem which would be well how do you contemplate a noumenon and that's where sacred you know the art of of religion is scripture and the art of liturgy is theology. I mean, these these things are not all disconnected. They they ways for us to perceive. So through liturgy and through scripture, we are actually contemplating phenomenon. We've got vestments. We've got you know actions. We've got content of of sermons, and then in the scripture we've got text texts to to actually read and and ponder. So there's still a phenomenon, but. So yeah, it's, it's on a sort of an edge between needing the the the, the vestiture of scripture and liturgy um, and community experience to mediate between an experience that is trying to bring. But you could say, you know, you could say poetry is the same, or painting, or, or drama. All the arts are trying to vest an experience of the noumenon somehow, be it a psychic experience or a spiritual experience. So yeah, it's 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 a, it's a bit of an open, an open ended question for me. Is is contemplative phenomenology really? I mean, it posits it in in the schools of philosophy, which is nice, but does it mm. really get to that edge? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it it leads me to think about this idea that um, it's actually through a strengthened thinking, a, a strengthened experience and understanding of what thinking is it's like in relation to whole being that is a, li a little part of at the root of this problem the uh the the scientific uh, natural scientific models like so that places uh, authority on what we see outside in the world that's proof of these uh, of these these models of these theories which has had the like the converse effect of um, of of weakening our own trust in using thinking to 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 look inside and to use that to examine our own personal experiences so like in the light of a theology um and i yeah I, 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 you might like to comment on that if it if it wakes any thoughts or, or anybody else yeah i i think at the end of this chapter, I come to these these four, um, mm -hmm. you know, going trying to back going back to medieval exegesis, and the, and the sort of a bit of a a renewal in in the Catholic sense through um, this. I'm just trying to find it in here um, with this this trying to find this this fifth sense, this spiritual sense. I've I've talked about you know, earlier this evening of these these four things that I that I named as part of the model, which is um the 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 the, the um the four ways to read the, the scripture, uh, which is the life of Christ was historical, um it's an objective spiritual entity Christ is, and then the mythical initiation stories and the Christ is a force with through which we can have the deification of the human capacities. And that fits in a little bit with um, the medieval, the four, the four, um, what we call them, the four senses of which the medieval exegesis took place, and um, the the Catholic 
um, reinterpretation of trying to bring that back in the four senses of scripture written by by Henry de Lubac um, in his in trying to bring them in is is you know literal history typological allegory of the past and present and the tropological moral implication for human virtue virtue and the analogical interpretation for the future we could see them as you know being so again, it's not it's not radical stuff that Steiner I'm naming Steiner stuff. It, it correlates a little bit with where exegesis in 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 the in the orthodox position takes place. But then de Lubac also brings about this question at the end of his book on um, the medieval exegesis, the four senses of scripture. He talks about the spiritual sense, and he so says we need to rediscover a direct contact with the Word of God, which has been opposed to the quite historical and disinterested concern to entire com enter completely into a system of thought that is presented in an obsolete garb of to facilitate understanding. And so this sense given by the spirit that de Lubac is pushing for um, follows St. Jerome. So it's not a new idea either, but it's really the sense that we can actually develop a sense for developing spiritual exegesis and you know there's this bit of a cry there that has been lost and um, you know I think Stein has got a real voice on developing the method of doing that. Raynand? Um, yeah, um, yeah going back to the concept of um, contemplative uh, my personal experience with anthroposophy, sinus anthroposophy uh, it appears to me that it is highly contemplative. Um, there are things that I need to understand and I must understand, but cannot be easily grasped using simply my senses, my five senses. So there is a degree of struggle there. That's why there are days and there are times that I've been, I, I, I'm just sitting in a chair and thinking a lot of things for six, eight hours before writing. Um, so yeah, it seems to me that uh, the nature of anthroposophy is highly contemplative. I think that makes sense why it is also known as um, spiritual science. Yeah. Uh, plus it's a method. Um, I also learned from my literature. Method, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, um, I also learned from my literature based from one of his lectures that we, we only create an image or a concept, we call it an idea, based from our percept or perception. So I'm thinking, what if there is no perception, therefore there is no image or there is no idea? So, so I said, okay, going back to my understanding of conventional science, especially in the physics world that, um, especially in the quantum mechanics, they say that nothing exists until it is being observed, especially in this physical world. We rely on our observation. So whatever we observe, we only create images or ideas based from what we observe. Otherwise, we cannot create an image. So in anthroposophical view, there are things beyond perception that still need to be understood, but only through contemplative and immense i should use the term immense profound yeah thinking yeah and, and for me what you've just said right now is is very much about um goes a little bit into um angus's question around mysticism and mystical because i've really tried to push that those two things the analytical mystical theology because this contemplation is not mysticism which is just the and, it, you know, oh, I've just had this wonderful thought while I was contemplating and I'm going to make that my, my my experience, the universal truth. Whereas this deep and intense contemplation that you, you talk about is relativized or, or sort of grounded in the real world through the analysis of my experience. So, and I, you know, I sort of developed that in the first chapter as well, that Steiner's criticism that can be seen as Steiner was, you know, a bit of a, a sort of a, power broker who just criticized everybody else's thought is actually a little bit can be turned to a little bit positively to say it's really important that we learn to critique our own experience 
through the lens of other people rather than just going, oh, you know, I've had this contemplation. It was a wonderful experience, you know, and I think la, 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 la. And then that becomes, you know, my my theology, whereas the analytical side of it is so important to to balance that intense contemplation. So very, you know, spot on with that contemplation as the method. Yeah. I think our hours probably. Um, up. Sorry. Oh, yeah, uh, very quickly, but to add to what you said as well. Um, so was it yesterday, but a few days ago, um, Nicola was, is aware of this as well. Dr. Bond from Rust, uh, Western University in Australia, um, a, a cosmologist, he, he did his PhD from University of Cambridge. Um, let me use his word. There's no such thing as um, uh, naturalism only, or like our universe is the only thing because this is the only thing we say. Therefore, this is the only thing. This is the everything of a story. It doesn't say really like that simply because we cannot see the other side. Then therefore, and we since we don't see the other side, so therefore we cannot say there is the other side. What we only see is this everything. So therefore, this is the everything. So something like that. That's what yeah, he yeah. tries to say. Yeah. So that is sensible because, again, we rely on our observation. So can we trust our observation all the time? Or is our observation the everything of our nature? Exactly. So going back to the concept of anthroposophy, contemplation, and all. So okay, thank yeah. you. And the observation of our spiritual experiences. These are the these are the difficult things of on defining a spiritual science, because they're not externals. They're not empirical. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, good. Okay, everybody. Well, thank you. I'll just turn the recording off.